In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. There's a famous legend that involves St. Augustine of Hippo. That is, he was in the process, or in the process of finishing up, one of his most famous works, which was titled On the Trinity. He was walking along the seashore, and he came across a strange sight. There was a little boy who was running back from the ocean to a spot on the shore, and all he had in his hand was a clamshell. And he was taking water from the ocean and running towards the shore and depositing the water into a hole that he had dug in the ground. And St. Augustine, being quite curious, asked the young man, What are you doing? He said, Well, I'm trying to empty the contents of the ocean into this little hole on the beach. And he said, Foolish boy, it is impossible to empty the contents of the entire ocean into a hole that is so small on the beach. To which the young boy replied, Is it any difference than you trying to empty the enormity and entirety of the Trinity into your feeble mind? Well, the legend has it that the boy he was talking to was none other than the Christ child. But it goes to show that when St. Augustine heard that, he realized that he can have these wonderful and lofty thoughts and produce an entire book on the Trinity and still really have no understanding of the enormity of who God is. Trinity Sunday is one of those Sundays in the church that makes preachers and priests really uncomfortable because we like to know, or at least we like to pretend to know, exactly what we're talking about. And sometimes, Father Earl and I, we put on a pretty good show (laughs) that we know exactly what we're talking about fully. Well, probably he probably knows. I'm the one who's fake it till you make it. But... So many preachers actually hand off this Sunday to somebody else. That's why so many many seminarians preach on Trinity Sunday. And I can say with full confidence how many times I've been asked to do it as a seminarian and an assisting priest. Because the joke is, no matter how well you preach about God, who is three in one and one in three, you're going to commit a heresy. You're going to make a mistake. People may not understand what you're talking about. So the question is, how do we do it? How do we try to make the best effort of helping the church, us, understand who God is? So instead of using shamrocks and water and any other kind of symbol, I want to do something different. I want to describe God not in who God is, but in what God does. And God invites us. From the beginning of all creation, God invited us to be the jewel of creation. That's why he made us last. Because everything in creation was leading up to us. And he invited us to be in perfect relationship and communion with him at all times. He invited us to be fully human by acting like Him, thinking like Him, and most of all, by loving like Him. And so throughout history, from the time that God creates and we fall short, God is constantly trying to invite human beings to be who they were created to be. Not an easy task when you consider how often We have failed and continue to fail. So then God submits to us, humanity, the ultimate invitation, the engraved, personalized invitation of Jesus Christ. And we hear that in the gospel today, you know, that gospel in a nutshell, John 3.16. God sends his only son into the world as an invitation to come back. To not only be fully human, but to be in full and perfect relationship with God again. But that invitation is hard. People are resistant. 
we don't always want to hear the ways in which we have run away from God. That we've spent our time being away from Him, not wanting to come to church, not wanting to accept the sacraments, not wanting to read Scripture, not wanting to have that relationship that we know that we need, especially in times of crisis. And so Christ goes around proclaiming the kingdom of heaven, inviting everybody who will listen, come through me to God. It is time to come home. That's why Jesus loves to tell that parable of the prodigal son, inviting us to with no fear and with no hesitation to just come home. When Jesus completes his work on the cross and he ascends to heaven... He tells the disciples that he's going to send somebody, the Holy Spirit. We call him the great comforter, not just because he comforts us, but because the word comfort means strength. Somebody who's going to give us the strength to finally answer that invitation. And so when the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit gives us yet another invitation that follows what God and Christ has done. And that invitation isn't just to be fully human, it's to be a temple for God. Now notice how I said temple, because a temple is used for worship. God did not send the Holy Spirit to invite us to be man caves for God, or living rooms for God, or back patios for God. It's not about relaxing. The Holy Spirit comes that we might be temples of God that are built for worship and for sharing God's loving word and sacraments with others. But that's dangerous in and of itself because the Holy Spirit also invites us to be on fire. And fire is pretty uncomfortable to our souls. Fire can clean our souls out, getting rid of all that dead wood that's in there from our sins from our failures, from our running away from God, until the only thing that's left is what God originally intended in the first place. People who were ready to love Him and to love others. In today's Gospel, though, we see something interesting. We see the visit by the Pharisee Nicodemus, and if we're having trouble understanding the Trinity, he is the person that we should model ourselves after. First of all, he comes by night. And the only reason you came by night, if you were a Pharisee, to come see Jesus is because you were scared of what other people might think. You were scared of kind of being kicked out of the club. And the truth is, even though as Christians we can be very brave, we still kind of worry what other people think. We can wear crosses and wonderful Jesus t-shirts and have the magnet on the back of our car. But there are times when we're still afraid to show just how Christian we are in the outside world because we could get ridiculed. We could get made fun of. We could be hurt by those who want to mock us. So Nicodemus comes by night and he asks Jesus all kinds of questions. And Jesus, being Jesus, explains to him exactly what it is. He doesn't mince any words. This is what you need to know. And this is why Jesus is, this is why uh, Nicodemus is my role model. Jesus explains it, and he still doesn't have any idea what he's talking about. And that's how I feel. I read scripture, I pray, and there are times when I still have no idea what Jesus is talking about. Did that happen to anybody else? Oh, yes. All right, okay, I'm not alone. Oh, yes. And so, Nicodemus, though, even though he doesn't understand, He doesn't give up. And we don't see that until the end of the gospel when they're taking Jesus down from the cross and Nicodemus appears again to help care for the body of Jesus at his burial. And at that point, he doesn't care who knows. He doesn't care who knows that he believes. All he cares about in that moment is caring for Jesus. So if we don't know or don't understand... Let's not despair. So what's the image that I want all of us to take home with us today to help us understand the Trinity? Well, on purpose, I put it on the front of the bulletin. So I want you to take a look at your bulletin here. 
I know that many of you take it home, but I want you to look at the cover. This is a very famous uh, clip art of an icon and picture that is of the story where Moses and his wife welcome the three visitors. And uh, they show tremendous hospitality. And some have believed in that painting, in that icon, that it really symbolizes the Trinity, kind of foreshadowing backwards into Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And the interesting thing I want you to look at in this picture is that from the perspective that you're looking at, there's something missing. Look at it. There's definitely something missing. You and I. You see, there's a chair there. There's a spot at the table for you and I. Not because we're God, not because we're equal with God, we know that we're not, but because God invites us to be in community with Him, to be in relationship with God to the point that He's willing to have us sit at the table and share with Him everything that He wants to offer us. And see, the beauty of a table is we have a choice whether or not we want to sit down. And so I invite everyone here to pray, reflect, study, and think about whether or not we want to sit at that table, about whether or not we want to be in communion and in relationship with the God who's been inviting us for thousands and thousands of years all the way from the beginning before we even knew who we were to be with Him. Because in the history of all creation, no one can take your place at that table. No one can take my place at that table. And so it'll be up for each one of us to decide if we're willing to deal with the confusion, deal with our doubts, deal with bad preaching on the Trinity, and finally, sit down. Amen.